Uh, last bit here are the guidelines for authorship. Um, Co-authorship, what are the advantages? Well, it can spread the workload, right? It can combine skills. Um, it can combine resources, right? Uh, it can enhance the visibility. Sometimes working with someone in a, whatever, a department or a different university or a different country can make it visible to that, uh, another audience. Um, it may speed up publication. Sometimes, you know, we've actually done this production process where we had someone in Australia, someone in East Africa, and someone in North America. And we were able to send it down the train for a week. Everyone worked on it like four hours, sent it on, and the paper just got hammered through. It was amazing. Usually works the other way, but it can happen. So the disadvantages, well, it can dilute the glory. You know, I mean, maybe this was your idea, you got the funding, you did the research, it's your brilliant idea, and then you just tack on some people for it. Well, that's just giving them credit for the things that you did, right? Diluting the glory. It can lead to disputes, it can lead to problems, and it can also lead to commons dilemmas. Sometimes people structure their interactions that somebody should do something. I agree, somebody should. I'm busy. Right? And that's what happens. So, you know, if you're going to do this, it really requires very clear leadership. You know, when I'm doing a paper, I'm asking people to write a section and I want them to do that section. And then I ask them, I want them to do certain tasks. I never make anything ambiguous. I always assign people what they should be doing and tell them the dates in which they should be doing it. I never leave it like, oh, I wonder if somebody would like to do... Nobody will ever do that. If I say, you need to do this and get it done by Tuesday, you'll probably actually do it. Um, and again, it can slow down publications. You know, Instead of having that speed train of time zones, you can get misalignments of time zones and weeks can go by and travel schedules and babies get born and all sorts of things can really slow the process down. Saying that because we just, <laughs> that was me for a long time. Yeah. Um, so, people generally lie about authorship in two ways that are important to recognize, right? They put down the, pe uh, the names of people who took little or no part in the research. This is called gift authorship, right? You're giving authorship to where it doesn't belong. And I have a strategy for getting, a w for moving away from this, and it involves a little bit of peer pressure and transparency in this. And what I do is when I send the manuscript to the group of people that we've talked about being co-authors, I have not determined that they're co-authors yet, I've said that they are potential co-authors, I do not put their name down. I write your name here and I ask them to send the man their corrections around to everyone else. And so what doesn't happen is someone just puts their name down and then sends it without doing anything else. Because the most embarrassing thing would be me writing, oh gee, Jane, I, I saw your name on there, but I didn't see any of your track changes. Can you please specify to the group, because I don't know who has it now, what changes you actually made to this manuscript, right? That's, I'm totally using peer pressure to get them to actually do the work, because I they don't nobody wants to be called out for doing no work. Right? So I do this your name here strategy where I tell them you can put your name down there and then I'll see which well I'll get to see where the track changes you made are uh, on the manuscript. So gift authorship is one, but the one that's probably a little bit more concerning is the sort of ghost authorship, and that's leaving the names of people out who do uh, who did take part in the research, and that's that, that's that name of sort of uh, ghost authorship, and that can be a real uh, problem to determine who really should be and shouldn't be uh, authors on a, a publication. So, preventing the problem is always better than solving it, and I recommend following three principles. Encourage a culture of ethical authorship, right? So, recognize gift and ghost authorship, and we'll go over two different criteria for authorship. Um, start discussing authorship when you plan your research. Who are the people that we think should be involved in this? And let's try to keep them in the loop. 
um, and decide authorship before you start each article, but then I would say revisit it along the way. So just because we determined early on that so-and-so should be part of this, if they haven't done anything since then, then they, maybe they shouldn't be. So let's go over two different criteria for, uh, for authorship, right? And the first is that, this is the one that I sort of go with. This is the way that I think about uh, who gets to who should be an author and who shouldn't be. I think about there being six elements of a research project, right? There's the concept, like you have the idea. Oh, we should do this cool thing on bright spots or whatever, right? There's the funding or the resources for it. So people can, you know, write, writing a grant for something can be really hard and really time consuming and can be a big contribution to it that you couldn't do the work with otherwise. There's things like designing the experiment. How would you go about investigating this, right? Yo, you need to do this, or maybe they go into a pilot version of that, right? There's the data collection. There's the data analysis. And then there's the write-up. Any one of those is insufficient to be an author. If you've only done one of those, you are not an author on a paper. So that's difficult because people often structure the interactions such that people are only ever given the opportunity to do one of those. And that's a problem, right? So if you're leading the research project, you should think back to who did these different things and determine whether these people should be given an opportunity to do other bits of it. So we, we say that you need to be doing two parts of these uh, to, to be an author, right? You need to be doing more than one. And typically, I often think of it's, it's one, one through five plus writing up. That's the way that I generally do it, but I would consider other ones where somebody maybe did the, uh, the data collection and did the analysis. I'd probably consider that uh, grounds for authorship as well. But typically, I do sort of one through five, one or two or three or four or five, and then number six uh, on there. And again, I just want to emphasize that it's important to give people the opportunity that contributed in earlier stages to be involved in those later stages. And that's kind of where I think power dynamics get, uh, get into it and, and a lot of people get left off of things that they probably should have been given an opportunity uh, to be involved in. This does get a little bit tricky when you've got sort of technicians that are sort of doing their job and then, you know, so if they're doing their job, which is whatever data collection or, you know, whatever element on there, it's, it's challenging then if, if they're not good at writing and they're not able to really contribute to that and you give them a manuscript and they're unable to actually contribute to that, ethically they should not be an author on that. If they can't make an intellectual contribution to that manuscript, and they only did the technical side, even if they were given the chance to, uh, to do that. But that's where it gets a little bit tricky. I mean, these are, these, are, uh, these are hard issues. So the other way of thinking about it, which is probably more commonly accepted than the way that, that, that I tend to do things, is from the, um, uh, the Vancouver group. And it, the sort of latest one in 2001 says that authorship criteria should be based only on one substantial contributions to the concept and design or the acquisition of data and analysis and interpretation of the data. Two, and so this is kind of the bit that I said there, drafting the article, revising it critically for important intellectual content, and three, final approval of the version uh, to be accepted. So what they're doing is, in my view, is taking their point number one was sort of my one through five, and they're saying you have to do that and uh, provide critical content to the writing. So to me, critical content isn't editing my English, right? It's, it's not punctuation. It's actually providing some critical content to it. Um, that can get challenging because we often are in situations where there's differing levels of capacity. So I kind of do that on a slightly sliding scale. You know, if I'm working with a, a genius postdoc that's got tons of free time 
and they just do some editing, I'm gonna say that that was unsatisfactory, but working with somebody that's got lower capacity and they're really trying and they're really engaging in it, I tend to sort of view that on a sliding scale and recognize that that was the extent of their contribution and you know, I try to work with them a little bit and do some mentoring on that side there. And so I'd probably think of those two maybe differently um, and, and be more likely to include somebody that doesn't have the opportunity and skills and, and to do that a little bit more. Um, uh, and so this Vancouver group suggests that the acquisition of funding, the collection of data or general supervision of the research group by themselves do not justify authorship. So just because I'm the PI in my research group doesn't mean that I should be an author on every publication that comes out of that. That's definitely my philosophy, but I know a lot of research groups work very differently than that. The person that tops on everything. And you know, again, to me, that's, that's not really ethical authorship because they're not necessarily involved in these different stages of it. 